It's March 1st, 1910, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. So it was on this day that Edwardian megastar and original punk rocker Eva Tangway was arrested after stabbing a stagehand three times with a hat pin. The accounts are quite muddled, but the clearest one I could find is that Tangway was performing in a theatre in Louisville, Kentucky, and she'd asked a prop handler to keep the backstage clear for her entries and exits. And in doing so, he accidentally knocked a stagehand called Clarence Hess down some stairs. And as Hess and some other stagehands <laughs> gathered round to remonstrate with the prop handler, Tangway herself charged in and apparently in the resulting melee she stabbed Hess three times in the abdomen. But apparently when she got to the police station because she was arrested for having stabbed somebody with a hat pin she just produced a roll of bills and cried take it all and let me go for it's now my dinner time (laughs) and they let her go and she was eventually fined $40. But that's celebrity power isn't it that star power and And yeah, we haven't heard of her, so we maybe lose a sense of just how massive Eva Tangway was. She'd had an enormous hit called I Don't Care, of which more later. And she made a lot of money as a headline vaudeville act. People would pay her $3,500 a week. And so Mm. she was like, I guess, Madonna at the peak of her powers turning up Mm. in your police station. She was in the papers every day for this kind of caper. Yeah, she was an absolute expert on how to play the publicity machine, which was really starting to roar into gear at this time, you know, the start of the 20th century. She was constantly planting fake stories that she'd been kidnapped, that she was fatally ill, that her jewels had been robbed. And one that I loved, she staged a fake wedding to a female impersonator called Julian Eltinger, where she dressed as a man and he dressed as a woman. (laughs) It's like Katie Price, actually. It's like that mashed with Madonna, isn't it? It's just like a real real savviness of what the papers need, the copy they need to hear. Yeah. Edward Bernays, the nephew of Freud and the so-called father of public relations, called Tangway our first symbol of the emergence from the Victorian age. And actually one of her hits was titled They'll Remember Me a Hundred Years From Now, which at the time must have felt like a total given. So it is peculiar that this many years later she's just pretty much forgotten. Well, let's just talk about how she made her name. So she arrived in New York at the age of 19, found work on the variety stage appeared in a show called Hoodoo and Rebecca I'm going to turn to you for this can you please explain (laughs) what hot dogging was because I looked it up on Urban Dictionary and I suspect it's very different but apparently she was hot dogging a chorus girl on stage they had a fight and then she ended up (laughs) Um, choking her castmate until the girl's face turned blue and she passed out what's hot dogging? yeah Okay, so let's just put it out there. Eva Tangway's dark side was evident from her very (laughs) earliest days. Like, this wasn't just, like, a funny diva flailing her hat pin around. She was... There was something wrong with Eva Tangway. Mm. There was... She physically attacked a lot of people. So hot-dogging apparently is trying to draw attention to yourself in the chorus line. So instead of doing the moves the other girls are doing, you're adding your little flourishes. Upstaging. Yeah, Mm. upstaging. But when she was called out on this upstaging, yeah, she choked her until she went blue in the face and passed out. And this was just one of many incidents like this. Apparently, on another occasion, in some kind of row to do with a heckler throwing a bread roll on stage, not quite sure, she <laughs> smashed another chorus girl's head into a brick wall. Ooh. There was one incident where she was fined for turning up late for a matinee performance, and in response, she slashed the curtain of the theatre to pieces with a knife. You know, there was something going on. Yeah, what's amazing, though, is that this is right at the very beginning of her career, as you say, Rebecca. She's not just playing the entitled star who's been on the scene for 20 years. This was right at the beginning and she then just completely lent into this character and incorporated it into her act where she had this incredibly unkempt hair and then on stage she was just this non-stop sort of gyration which earned her the nicknames the Cyclonic Comedienne and the Queen of Vivacity and her costumes were really outlandish. One was constructed entirely of feathers and another was made of newly introduced Lincoln pennies and very skimpy which landed her on several occasions in legal trouble that she was uh, very quick to publicise as ever. But she'd often also switch her outfits in front of the audience, which kind of raised the erotic stakes yet further. (laughs) Yeah, so this is where we get to the hit, right? I don't care. It's from the 1904 Mm. musical comedy The Sambo Girl. You can use your own imaginations as to why that is rarely performed now. She was playing the lead brownface role and stole the show with this song 
by the songwriters Gene Lennox and Harry O. Sutton. Incidentally, it's also the song that Britney Spears, age 10, sang on Star Search. Uh, you can find that oh, on wow. YouTube. And you can also find, I'll put it in the show notes, Tangway's own recording, because it's the only recording she ever made. It's terrible quality, but you get a sense of, of what her shtick was, singing this song. And it's kind of, if people do not try to treat me fair, there is naught can amaze me, dislike cannot daze me, because I don't care. That's it, but like <laughs> with a bit more of a compelling personality. But the reason it latched on to her is she'd already established, as we said, that she had this quirky, don't-care personality, that would have been embarrassing to most other women, even performers, wouldn't it? If you had a reputation like that, what made her punky, like you said, Rebecca, is she's embracing it, isn't she? Like, that became her song because it completely recasts this notion from the Victorian days of, like, female hysteria and says, I'm owning this as a badge of honour. I'm nuts, but look at me. Mm. It's so hard to describe what her appeal was because... (sighs) There was like a sex element to the act, but she wasn't sexy, or at least she wasn't sexy in a way that was pandering to a sort of male fantasy of sexiness. If you look at the posters of her, she's got this wild mass of hair, wild. and she's sort yeah, of that's str- the word. she's straddling a backwards mm. chair, wearing almost like a bodycon play suit. Yeah, but that is what's sexy, isn't it? It's the attitude, it's the uninhibited nature of it. Yes, it's all the attitude, but she's not playing the game, do you know what I mean? She's not hitting the standard beats of sexiness. No. She's really fleshy as well, yeah. Yeah. and that was all playing into her act too, that she was just this force of nature so it was sexual but she wasn't really sexy it was almost like it reminds me of Mae West yes, yeah, totally. yeah. you know like she'd have delivered all these innuendos but she wasn't sexy exactly she was sexy because of her attitude yeah and some of these were like single entendres as well like some of her song titles were go as far as you like kid and i want someone to go wild with me i mean it's not subtle (laughs) and it's interesting actually ollie that earlier you used the word personality because there was this 1911 printers inc article which said she can neither sing nor dance nor recite just the same eva commands the money the audience wants her she has personality and she then really leaned into that as well and she had a song that came out soon afterwards that was called personality that went personality personality that's the thing that always makes a hit your nationality or your rationality doesn't help or hinder you one bit yeah and i think it explains why the 1922 recording as you said ollie her only recording and two silent films she starred in just didn't do justice to what her appeal was when you listen to the recording her voice is like it's rough it's pretty unappealing at the time a critic called it a hair shirt to the nerves but (laughs) actually one of the lyrics to I don't care she sang my voice may sound funny but it's getting me the money so I don't care she was so self-referential in her lyrics quite sort of Eminem or something yeah she had another song that was called an animal in the zoo which was all about her being so famous she literally says there's a method in my madness there's meaning in my style the more they raise my salary the crazier I'll be she really actively was after controversy That's like the through line through her entire career. And in 1908, she had this production of Salome where the role of John the Baptist was played by George Walker, who was a black vaudeville star, whose head was revealed on the silver platter. He was obviously still underneath it. He wasn't (laughs) decapitated for the role. But then throughout the performance, his eyes followed her as she stripped. And that was very taboo busting for the time. And then she went on to have a publicised affair with Walker, which was scandalous for two reasons. One, because it was interracial but also he was actually married so it was like it was pure box office did you encounter the letter to henry ford oh yeah but this is the sad part isn't it it is this is later yeah so she lost her fortune in the wall street crash basically didn't she like i guess a lot Mm. of people of that era did yeah, and she had loads of health problems too that all seemed to come on at once. She had, I think, arthritis, she had Bright's disease. She had everything going wrong with her po- that possibly could, so she just didn't have a way to make the money back. She also spent wildly. She bankrolled this plan to play baseball at night in 1914. She was actually a sports enthusiast herself, and she predicted correctly that playing games at night would be a really popular thing to do and would actually increase attendance, but this didn't work and she lost more of her money. Yeah, she winded up in Hollywood like opening shops that sold her old costumes and if you think that sounds a little bit Norma Desmond well apparently she was the inspiration for Sunset Boulevard I think that's where the Dance of the Seven Veils Salome thing comes from but anyway she wrote a letter to Henry Ford which we still have this letter is from Eva Tangway of the stage she puts in brackets I hope you remember me once you were in the audience when I played Detroit and anyone who has seen me before the footlights is interested in me. It's just heartbreaking, isn't it, already, before you even know what she's going to ask. Mm. I was thinking, in the generosity of your heart, you could give me a car. I've always had a car, having owned 11, but now have nothing. I live off a sort of an alley in a small house which is set in back of a big one. There's no view other than the backyards of other houses. 
It's very sad to have had so much and be cut down to poverty, but my illness prevents me from doing any work, although I could sing on radio if the programme was without the audience viewing the entertainer. Mm. Yeah. Also, he said no. He did. <laughs> he, just, he got the letter and was like, He didn't nope. ignore it either. Like, he got his secretary to write back and say, yeah, no, sorry, yeah, but don't give away cars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be fair, it's a good job she wasn't in better health or Henry Ford would have got a serious stab. <laughs> Tomorrow. You know, the emperor believed God was on his side when he was about to be invaded. Baraceri wanted to retreat. Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.